Well, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our second Issues in National Security lecture held in the virtual world. I'm uh, Professor John Jackson. I'll serve as host for today's event. Please feel free to ask questions using the chat feature of Zoom, and we'll get to them at the conclusion of the presentation. Uh, I'd like to ask now if uh, Admiral Chatfield would like to uh, say any comments before we begin the lecture. Admiral? Good afternoon to all the participants here, and thank you for signing on. Uh, we're delighted to continue our Issues in National Security uh, Spouse Lecture Series, and uh, I'm here with my husband, David Scoville. He's got a few words for the group. Hello, all. Welcome back. Uh, this is uh, the second time we uh, are meeting to handle the um, Issues in National Security online. So it's, uh, what a great turnout last week. We're thrilled and uh, we have um, a special guest uh, at the end of this. This will be um, uh, from our uh, military one source. We have Melissa Fuimara joining us tonight as well. So welcome, Melissa. Thank you, David. Thank you, Admiral. I'm uh, very pleased to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. James Holmes. Jim is one of the most prolific writers at the college and is known by almost everyone in the maritime security business. He holds the J.C. Wiley Chair of Maritime Strategy here at the college, and he previously served on the faculty of the University of Georgia School of Public and International Affairs. A former U.S. Navy surface warfare officer, he was the last gunnery officer in history to fire a battleship's big guns in anger during the first Gulf War in 1991. He earned the Naval War College Foundation Award in 1994, recognizing him as the top graduate in his class. The latest version of his widely read book, Red Star Over the Pacific, is a primary reading on the Chief of Naval Operations professional reading list, and most recently he published a brief guide to maritime strategy. I'm not exactly sure why, but former SecDef James Mattis considers him troublesome. His talk this afternoon will explain why it's so hard for the U.S. Navy to prevail in strategic competition or warfare in the Pacific, even though it remains stronger than its competitors. He will review geography, naval budgets, combat capability, and much, much more to show why there is a strong need to ensure that we are in the Pacific when we need to be there might arise. I'm pleased to pass the digital baton to a friend and colleague, Dr. Jim Holmes. Jim? Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks, Captain Jay. Uh, Captain Jay was my, actually my last boss on active duty, which, uh, which I always remind everybody of. Uh, uh, I'm thrilled to be coming to, with, to you tonight, not from Spruance Auditorium, but some, from somewhere along the shores of the Narragansett Bay to talk to, to you about U.S. maritime strategy and zombies. I, uh, and you'll see why I've actually reached back to the, to the pop culture as I, as I go along. Now, this is a, it's a presentation that's been about a decade in the making, as far as I can tell. It, it originated with the, art, with the article that I've shown on the screen, uh, which was a 2010 article for a journal over in, uh, uh, over in South Korea. And they asked, how do you count up the size and the strength of a Navy? Figure out who is stronger than whom. And as you, uh, as you can see from the title, of the simple talking points that you get, especially in election years, as I'll go through in the next uh, in the next hour with you. So, if I can get the slide to advance, Oop, I think I'm, I think I'm actually having a little trouble getting my slide show to work here. Let me let me stop and start back up here. Okay. All right. Now let's see what we can do here. Oh. Ah, there we go. So back to the opening, back to the opening slide, which shows our one of many of you know the War College, obviously, because you've been here. Obviously, none of us are there. So anyway, let, let me uh, get off to get off to a run. I, uh, it was and actually the first time I noticed this was in the 2012 election campaign. I felt like Rick Grimes, the star of uh, The Walking Dead, of which we were huge fans at the time. 
And the reason why is because there's these different ideas and different talking points about naval power kept coming at me. I felt like I did nothing but answer questions every day about how to count up the strength of a Navy and figure out whether we were strong enough to do what our strategy requires us to do. You know how it is fighting zombies. You, you shoot one down with a headshot and 10 more just like it come behind, behind it. You ultimately exhaust your ammunition, they trample you and they feast on your flesh. So I hope that uh, I hope that I will uh, de debunk some of these uh, talking points for you that we were likely to encounter this in, during this election year, uh, and hopefully make you into zombie fighters yourself. To help you ask the hard questions when you hear these sorts of things. Now, before I launch into the meat of it, I will tell you that uh, I thought about writing a special coronavirus edition of this uh, lecture, but I decided not to. I decided to run it straight up. And, but I hope that it's, uh, during the Q&A at the end, we can, we can uh, talk about the coronavirus and how it impinges on what, I have been, what I've been saying and what we might expect to see as the election season heats up and, host, and hopefully as the uh, pandemic winds down. So with that, let me run, launch right into it. Here's my agenda. I like to provide my agenda straight up so you know exactly where I'm going all the waypoints. Uh, first of all, I want, I want to look at our strategy, especially in the Pacific region, in the Indo-Pacific region as we've taken to calling it in recent years, which, uh, which, which takes place under the rubric of the pivot to Asia, a term out of the Obama administration. I'll talk a little bit about what that means. Then I, will get, then I will consider whether we have enough forces in place to do what we need to do, which is to be able to win against uh, our likely opponents under certain circumstances. And thus, if we can win, we can hopefully deter them in peacetime as well. And then lastly, as John uh, led off by saying, I'll talk, I'll talk to you a lot about the geography of why it is hard to win, even if we do have enough forces in the Pacific uh, to, get, to get it done. So, I'll leave you, I'll leave you with sort of a wishy-washy a wishy assessment of where we stand and hopefully give you some tools to think about, uh, th think about whether we can get where we want to go. So the idea of a pivot to Asia, or as the Pentagon quickly took to calling it the rebalance to Asia back in 2011-2012 timeframe, uh, it's a term that came out of an essay the, uh, from uh, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton in late 2011, basically saying that the United States needed to swing forces uh, towards, that, towards the Pacific theater in order to counter the rise of China. So that was, so that was, I mean, it was very controversial, but I think it's actually stayed in place. And in fact, I think our force structure does, uh, does indeed favor, uh, favor the Pacific uh, command by about 60, 40 now. Now, if you, whenever you want to get to know or try to figure, parse out what our strategy actually is, sometimes it's kind of hard because uh, you listen to speeches and all that kind of thing. Uh, one authoritative place to look is simply in the documents that the services and the Pentagon publish. Uh, the, two, uh, the two documents that I put on the screen in front of you, the one to the left is the 2007 Maritime Strategy, uh, a Bush administration, do a Bush administration uh, document. It's kind of interesting, this stuff is all bipartisan, even though we may squabble with each other, uh, but the basic ideas seem to carry forth from administration to administration of both parties. So that, and the one on the right comes out of the Obama administration, the 2015, what they called the refresh, basically the revised version of the maritime strategy for the Coast Guard, the Navy, and the Marine Corps. What do these, what do these documents basically say? Let me, to, to make a long story short, let me just reach back to the 2007 strategy, which was very tersely written. And I thought it was a very good document. The three basic ideas I think that pertain to us today are these, and I think they endure into the, into the other documents that uh, shape our strategy. First, the idea that the United States intends to remain number one in the Western Pacific, the Indian Ocean, and the Persian Gulf region, or the Indo-Pacific region along with the, along with the Middle Eastern region. Uh, this idea of credible combat power, I think, indicates that we intend to remain number one for the shelf life of these documents, so the next 10 to 15 years. And it, again, it seems to be sliding to the right as each administration signs on to this idea. Uh, secondly, and most uh, controversially, uh, the idea that we, that we will reserve to ourselves the right to seize local sea control at times and places of our choosing, with allies pre preferably, but, uh, but perhaps with not if our allies choose not to join us. That's, a, that's actually a pretty controversial thing to say, and that's, that's at the heart of what we will be talking to, to, talking to tonight. The idea that I can seize control of waters against, uh, against the major adversaries of shores, such as the China Seas, South China Sea, Western Pacific, what, whatever the case may be. That's actually a pretty controversial thing. It goes well beyond anything that, uh, 
uh, for example, Alfred Thayer Mahan, our second uh, president and the most uh, prominent scholar ever to teach at the War College, would have, would have conceived of in the 1890s when, when controlling the Caribbean Sea and the Gulf of Mexico were the, the major tasks for the United States Navy and the affiliated services. And lastly, the other, bit, the other big idea and something that you should also watch out for when you peruse the daily news is the idea that the United States is the keeper of the system. When you hear people talk about the system, they're talking, they're, they're talking about the system of uh, international uh, trade and commerce, especially maritime trade and commerce. This, uh, th that leads into the next document that I'll share with you just briefly, another one out of the Obama administration. I stood up and cheered in 2015 when this, uh, when this document appeared online and immediately uh, dumped, this, uh, dumped this image into, the, uh, into this presentation. The idea, the idea and then here's page one of it, it, I, I just thought it was great because it, uh, it front loaded that one of my favorite talking points to, to page one, why we safeguard freedom of the seas. When you hear the idea of freedom of the seas, that's the idea that no one owns the sea, uh, except for some very limited, uh, very limited exceptions codified in international law. The seas are a common, a common, if you look around uh, Newport or any New England town, a common is nothing more than a green space that belongs to everyone and belongs to no one. Ships, ships, planes, and whatnot from all nations may use this common uh, freely without being interfered with. So when you think about what the United States is saying, it is going to preserve the ability uh, of shipping from all nations to use the common uh, uh, for, for purposes as they see fit. And it will not allow, uh, will not allow a coastal state to, to essentially say that it owns that, as China seems to do, have done in the South China Sea in particular, where, particular where it declares that it is sovereign, meaning that what it says goes. So the United States has set, it, it set itself against that idea uh, that coastal states can actually, in effect, own the sea. Yeah, why we safeguard the freedom of the sea? So that's a, but if you think about it, that's a really big task that we're talking about when you consider the amount of water on the earth, uh, the amount of uh, potential adversaries who might challenge the freedom of the sea and so forth. So I would, I would leave that idea out for you. Now, before we leave the documents uh, part of the presentation, I, just to show you that this, I think, does carry forward into the, into the uh, Trump administration. This is a document from last summer uh, in, which it, in which it essentially says just much the same thing as the last two administrations have. The Indo-Pacific, the combined Indian Ocean and Pacific region, is the Def Department of Defense's priority theater. If it's the priority theater, that is job one. It has primary claim on our resources, on our energy, uh, on all the effort that we can, get, that we can put into uh, defending our interests and our ideals in that region. So again, I think it is, it's, it's, it's actually kind of a heartening thing when we, when we, when we squabble at, all, at each other all the time to see that there actually is some continuity in the big ideas that shape uh, what we try to do in the world. So, what this all translates into, and again, this these ideas of a, this idea of a 60-40 split actually reaches back all the way to the Bush administration when 60% of the submarine fleet was already in the region, and it is it, it, it continued through the Obama administration and into the Trump administration. Here's the USS Ronald Reagan, which spearheads the U.S. Seventh Fleet in the very fine seaport uh, of uh, Yokosuka, Japan, in the really the face of our, our sea power presence in the Western. The question the question is though. Is this enough? It's, it's one thing to say we'll unbalance the force to fav favor our primary commitment, as indeed we should, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's enough to win against our likely adversaries. And thus, if we, can, if we uh, don't have the ability to win, and if they doubt that we have the ability to win, chances are they may not be deterred in peacetime. Uh, and then they must, and thus they might try on things like uh, an invasion of Taiwan or, uh, or slapping around Vietnam in the South China Sea, whatever the case may be. So. I'm making light of a lot of this stuff by talking about pop culture, but it is actually a very, very serious uh, topic that we're, that we're into tonight. So th this is where you start to encounter the zombies, which uh, again, over so th th and let me, still, let me start by saying that uh, none of these ideas, none of these ideas, none of these talking points are wrong in themselves. What is wrong is to take a single simple idea and extrapolate it as though it tells the entire story. With, uh, but by the time you come down to the end, you really have to factor in all of these things and it becomes a very, very complex, uh, very, very complex uh, assessment to make, which is one reason why we have things like war gaming facilities at places like Newport to try to parse that and see how this would happen under real world circumstances. So the first idea, the first, uh, the first zombie that we need to, to, that we need to shoot down is what I would call the idea that he who pays the most win. He who spends the most on, on the armed forces wins. 
I guarantee you sometime sometime this year once the once the virus once the virus starts to abate a bit and we start hearing more about uh, strategic affairs you're probably going to see in some major outlet a, a chart like this this is out of the Washington Post from the 2016 campaign uh, which we all remember so well and look at it look at what it actually says it's actually drawing a really simple inference our defense spending dwarfs that of the rest of the world and therefore by implication we win we have to win because we're spending more than the next, in this case, four to 14 uh, uh, powers combined. Look how small China's uh, spending is compared to the United States in, in, in terms just of the visual blocks, if, if you believe China's defense figures, which uh, I would certainly take with a grain of salt. But the bottom line, again, it's, it's, it's really hard to extrapolate uh, from spending figures to strategic and operational and tactical effect effectiveness. I mean, we a lot of our stuff. If you want to be the keeper of the system across the globe, if you want to, if you want to uh, police theaters from the from the Mediterranean Sea to the Indian Ocean, you have to spend a lot. This is a this is a picture of the uh, the USS Zumwalt, our latest destroyer, which is just now entering service. Uh, when it was sitting over at Pier One a few years ago, on its way to uh, San Diego, the ship uh, the ship runs about four point four billion dollars last count. That's a very expensive piece of kit for a destroyer. So if you, when you look at our overall defense budget, yes, it is big, but things like this eat into it. Or how about aircraft carriers, which we're always hearing about, uh, whether they're survivable and this sort of thing. Uh, this is USS Ford, which is now uh, starting to overcome its, uh, its growing pains, thankfully. Uh, this ship runs about $13 billion, and that's just for the hull. That's before you start paying sailors, before, before you put supplies and ammunition on board, and before you put airplanes on board. So that's it. You take that $13 billion, put a couple of squadrons uh, of F-35s at about $100 or excuse me, $100 billion a pop. You're probably adding another couple of billion dollars and on and on. You're probably looking at, uh, when you look at the carrier and its escorts, you're looking at uh, probably over a $20 billion asset. That's it. You're talking about a large amount of taxpayer dollars. And again, something that will eat into, eat into that massive defense budget that we need if we're going to do big things in the world. But it, it doesn't really stop there. That's just recapitalizing the surface fleet and, and naval aviation. Uh, a project that's about to get underway this summer, including right here on the Narragansett Bay over, over at Quonset Point, is the construction of our new generation of ballistic missile submarines at about $7 billion a pop. We're gonna get, uh, tw we're gonna get uh, 12 of those at about, so for a total of about $84 billion. Our, uh, our uh, b ballistic missile submarines are wonderful, but they're, but they're getting old and they have to have to have to be replaced. And this is a, this is a project that's uh, the Navy, certainly under Admiral Richardson before Admiral Gill Day, our CNO, uh, the Navy feared that it was going to eat up our entire procurement budget, even without buying anything else. So we've got a whole lot of stuff that we're trying to do uh, in, the two, in the 2020s. And uh, I think that's something we really have to have a debate about as a nation. But even that, even that doesn't really, uh, doesn't really tell the entire story. Uh, estimates have it that uh, a, a Chinese PLA Navy sailor, or excuse me, the Chinese PLA Navy can actually put eight to nine sailors in uniform for the cost of one American sailor, because we do pensions, we do health care, we do all that, we pay more generously and so forth. We have high cost labor, much like in the old, in the old, in the old top gear, if you, if you used to watch that. One imagines this uh, professional race driver, the Stig, is not low cost, low cost labor to drive around these supercars. And I think that's a really, really a metaphor for U.S. personnel policy uh, in the military. Yes, we should do it, but it is also something that uh, that uh, uh, that that equalizes out defense budgets that are seemingly lopsided in America's favor. Bottom line: ask the hard questions when you hear this sort of simple metric uh, indicating that the United States is fated to win because because it simply is not the case. This is not unimportant. It's not, uh, but it uh, it's, it certainly does not tell the entire story. Okay, so let me move on to the next uh, the next fallacy that I would uh, call to your attention. I, and I would I would say this is a, I would I call this he who weighs the most. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean you, you get statements even from the greats in the field. This is a friend of mine. This is a Robert Kaplan, one of the great geopolitics scholars of our age. In stage in uh, Spruance Auditorium a couple of years ago. And he said that he said a striking thing. The United States Navy is the largest in the world by far. The Coast Guard is the 12th largest Navy in the world. Well, he might say Bob might actually get an argument from he might actually get an argument from the former Pacific Fleet uh, 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 intelligence chief, uh, Captain Jim Fennell, 
uh, who a couple of years ago did a, did a wonderful chapter uh, projecting that the PLA Navy might actually have about 500 ships by the year 2030 at a time when the United States Navy is struggling to get to 355. That throws a little bit of a, I think that throws a little bit of cold water on the, on the idea that, uh, that we are so much bigger than the PLA. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense if you took up the numbers. Or how about Mike O'Hanlon, another one of the greats in the field of defense studies down at the uh, Brookings Institution, rightly observes that the Navy has emphasized uh, technology over numbers. It comes down in the same place. Our tonnage is still three times of China, that of China's. And that sort of starts to get to the nub of it. You're actually talking about aggregate tonnage of the fleet. You're not talking about capability or anything else like that. Our ships are bigger. Well, I mean, that's not, again, this is another uh, statistic that is not meaningless. If we want to do things in the Western Pacific, we have to carry a lot more fuel, a lot more supplies. We have to bring all our ammunition and so on and so forth just to get into the theater. So by, by, simply by definition, we have to have more capacious vessels even to, even to get into the combat theater. But again, I think this is a, this is a really misleading statistic. We, we, you simply can't say that because we weigh the most, we have the most tonnage in our fleet that we, that we win. And so what? I mean, if you take that logic to its extreme, this is the most powerful warship on the planet Earth. This is the Emma Maersk out of the, out of the Maersk line over in Denmark, uh, which bulks in about 550,000 tons. It's, uh, it's about five times, it displaces about five times what the USS Ford does if you take it, if you take it in terms of displacement which obviously makes no sense whatsoever. This is an unarmed freighter. It carries cargo. It is not a warship at all. But the logic of, of gross tonnage makes that, makes that a logical thing to say. So be, please do push back when you hear this sorts, of, this sorts of statements, assuming that the United States, because we have a bigger fleet in terms of size, is definitely going to win. Unless we're going to ram each other, I don't think it actually works. I mean, think about it. As we try, as we try to recapitalize the Patriots for the post-Tom Brady era, is this who Co Coach Belichick is trying to recruit to the offensive line or, or let alone to the quarterback position? This dude's got a lot of bulk. He, 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 uh, he abides by the law of gross tonnage. But, yeah, love that zit on his, uh, on his gut right there. Yeah, that's, really, that's really awesome. But if you, if you want to actually have a metaphor that I think actually means something and when, you, when you look at tonnage, turn to, turn to sumo wrestling. If this guy on, your, on my right here, if that guy is a metaphor for the days, big and strong and bulky, if we take that to all our tonnage and turn it into effective combat capability, that's a cool thing. If we can sling the PLA, I'm, uh, I'm pretty good with that. So please, uh, please ask the harder questions as when you hear ter 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 uh, terms like uh, the idea that gross tonnage is going to actually make the difference in, in battle. It, seem, it simply not, me, need not be the case. Next idea, next uh, false idea would be, I, th I think this, this is the, the, the great one of Teddy Roosevelt. This would be the idea that sort of the counting up halls is, is the way to, to determine who is definitely going to win. And again, not a meaningless uh, statistic, but also, but also uh, taken as the, the only index of who's going to win in battle, which is what it's all about. And I think this is a, this actually brings up, a, it's almost a battle of false ideas or, or a battle of talking points between people who think numbers are everything, numbers of hulls are everything, and numbers of, and that numbers of hulls really mean very little at all. You'll, and this, is, this would be one argument that I would expect to see uh, heat up in the fall uh, as we come up to the election with the Republicans, uh, with the Republicans uh, emphasizing numbers of hulls and the Democrats pushing back against that. But we'll see how, we'll see how the, how the uh, political constellation shapes up. Now, this is, this is another, another one from uh, the early stages of the, uh, of the 2016 campaign as we were having the conventions and so forth. And, it's, and it's, this is the idea, a talking point, that the Navy is now the smallest since 1917. That refers to the number of hulls in the Navy. And indeed, if you, if you scroll back to 1917, when we had just embarked on, the, on the, uh, a fleet buildup that would make us a Navy second to none, it is actually true. But how much does it mean? That's really the question. And PolitiFact, uh, kind of, they actually uh, concluded that it doesn't mean very much, which is kind of, which is kind of to their credit in that sense. On the other side, or, oh, actually, I uh, built in a, state, a recent statement from one of the uh, Republican members from the uh, uh, Senate sub Sea Power Subcommittee, uh, Representative, or excuse me, Senator Purdue of Georgia. He's basically uh, saying the same thing. The Navy is the smallest since back then when we were a one ocean Navy. Now we need to be a two ocean Navy. We better get lots more hulls in the water very fast. So that's on the one side. On the other side, as I said, you know, there will be spirited pushback on this idea 
uh, probably from the leftward side of the aisle. We'll see how that. So we'll see how everything shapes up. It's it's not always all easy to predict by uh, by uh, terms or in terms of what political party who's going to be pro big navy and who's not. Joe Courtney of uh, of Groton is a big submarine guy, obviously, because that's in his district, and he chairs the uh, committee in the House. This is a, uh, but here's a here's a representative. That sort of thing you will hear. This is uh, Secretary Mavis, our last Secretary of the Navy under President Obama. In fact, he was Secretary for uh, President Obama's entire term. And he says uh, it's, it's pointless. It's pointless to compare this, this Navy of today with the 1917 Navy. Something advanced. Would you put the, today's Navy up against the Great White Fleet? Who do you think is going to win? And that's basically, well, that's basically, I think, what he's saying. Ships today are much more technologically advanced, and therefore, it's a meaningless comparison. Which is a fine point to make. We sure, I certainly wouldn't uh, stack the, the Great White Fleet up against our fleet today because it would never get within reach to get off a shot against a missile armed fleet and uh, an aircraft armed fleet of such as ours. But what gets lost in this, I think, is the fact that the strategic environment has also moved on by a century. The Great White Fleet faced uh, one source sort of threat. Our, the threat to the threat today is vastly more, uh, vast, vastly more menacing. And thus, you have to actually measure our naval power uh, in relation to what we're actually going to face in combat if we get into a fight with one of the one of the potential red teams. I mean, think about it. Did the Great White Hat Fleet have to face off against uh, stealth fighters put out by the PLA Air Force? I don't think so. So yes, I mean, it's a, so yes, in a sense, it's a, it's a fallacy to look back to 1917, but at the same time, you have to update, you have to update your comparison, taking that strategic and operational environment into context, or else you're setting yourself up for all sorts of uh, miscalculations. And perhaps, uh, perhaps we would even misplan, misplan our force, end up too weak to accomplish what we need to. So where I would leave you on this, just sort of in a wishy-washy way, no question about that, we're going to lose some in action. Numbers are not everything. So again, when you hear these uh, when you hear these little talking points, uh, please ask the tough questions. As I as I keep saying, next fallacy, and with the with ships uh, uh, approach, which would be that if we want to figure out which uh, who's going to win in action, we flip open we flip and over open the, the the requisite volume of Jane's fighting ships for the PLA Navy, the one for the United States Navy, and compare navies, compare numbers of hulls, compare types of ships, compare weapons ranges, uh, all these sorts of things, and figure out who's going to win. If the United States Navy looks stronger on paper, we're good to go. Well, I, I, think, that's, I think that's misleading because it implies that sea power is all about ships. It, it, it absolutely drives me nuts. Uh, a Chinese carrier is not nearly as powerful as an American carrier, which is true, but also not really all that relevant. It's these, I mean, if you look at what we are going to do and what we will talk about for the rest of our time together tonight, you will see that uh, sea power is not all about ships. And in fact, I would say about ships and fleets every day as land-based uh, weaponry uh, becomes more and more capable, more precise, and able to hit us out at sea. I think this is the image, this is the kind of image I think people have in mind when they go comparing American destroyers to Chinese destroyers or whatever the platform uh, might be. This is a, an image from the Battle of Jutland in 1916, in which indeed the uh, the German Grand or the excuse me the German High Seas Fleet met the British the British Grand Fleet out in the North Sea, remote from any shore-based weaponry, and they outside without any outside uh, involvement of shore-based defenses. So that I mean that's very much a navy on navy engagement, in, and in that case the comparison makes sense, but it doesn't make sense anymore. As I said a minute ago, sea battle today, maritime battle today involves a lot more than fleets. And we'll talk about some of the things that it do, do, does involve. In fact, it involves more than navies. I would say we are very much headed into an era of joint sea power involving not only the United States Marines, which is, uh, which is remaking itself as a maritime force after, uh, after over a decade of land battles, but also even the United States Army, which is taking merit its maritime role seriously, and even the United States Air Force, let alone our allies, which also have a stake in this, in the, in this fight as well. I mean, think about some of the things that land-based forces can bring to the fight out at sea. This is a squadron of Chinese uh, PLA Air Force fighters. If these things can range out over water, if they carry anti-ship missiles, they, you, have to, you have to consider their firepower when you try to figure out who is going to win. It doesn't matter whether that anti-ship missile comes from a ship or from a land-based aircraft. If it's on the scene at the right place in the right time, it has to figure into the mix. And that's something that I 
the battles of talking points, especially in an election year. Or how about this? This is something that's, uh, that is occasion an enormous amount of talk uh, in our field, in my, in my field in particular, of China studies in recent years. This is uh, the DF-21D anti-ship ballistic missile, evidently the first working missile of its type in the world. A, 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 a truck launched anti-ship missile that from Chinese soil can reach out, the Pentagon estimates about 900 nautical miles out to sea and hit moving ships. That means they can reach out and touch us long before we get to Japan, Taiwan, South China Sea, any potential combat theater. So that's, a, that's something that we have to factor in. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But it doesn't actually stop there. There's, in, in 2015, uh, the PLA, during a, during a military parade in Beijing, unveiled what they call the, the DF-26, a longer range anti-ship ballistic missile. The Pentagon estimates it, it can reach out about 2,000 uh, nautical miles which means in geographic terms that uh, if they can find us out at sea, which remains an open question and it uh, occasions a lot of squabbling, but if they can find us out at sea with this thing, they can hit us long before we get to Guam to the second island chain. So that's way out in the Pacific Ocean. So again, this is another system that, uh, that you have to factor into the relative balance of sea power to try to figure out who is stronger, who can win, who can, and if we can deter our adversaries. Here's a, here's a representation. I'm not sure if this is out of, I can't remember whether, what this comes out of. It might want to be one of the annual Pentagon reports on Chinese military power, which are very much worth your time. But it basically shows, if you look at these range rings uh, encircling the Chinese coastline, these are, this, this shows how far this hardware can reach out. Whether it's that outer, that, this outer, uh, this outer, uh, this outer uh, range ring indicates how far a bomber with, land, with uh, cruise missiles can go out and on inward. But you, you get, you get, you get a sense by overlaying that onto the map exactly how hard it is even for us even to get to the fight when you take all this stuff into account. So again, it's not just the PLA Navy we have to worry about. It's the Air Force, the Army, the Strategic Rocket Force of the PLA. All these sorts of things can, can, can come into the fight and, and cause us harm. In fact, I mean, just a, just a couple of representative uh, uh, PLA Navy uh, supporting forces, not part of the surface fleet or the carrier fleet, but uh, I would describe the the conventional submarine for, force still, even after all these years of Chinese military buildup, as the core of the PLA Navy, as we've seen it take shape over the past uh, 20 years or thereabouts. These are things that can lurk offshore. They don't need to go at high, at high speed or anything like that. They can perform sentry duty and thus try to do us harm as we try to get to the fight. They can, they can do us damage and thus make it hard for us to accomplish what we need to. Or uh, down at the bottom, the Type, the type 22 Hobay Catamaran. Uh, the PLA Navy's built about, uh, uh, I think about 85 of these things at last count, uh, each of which is stealthy, small, and carries eight anti-ship missiles. That's something, again, that's, uh, that's suitable for lurking offshore, uh, performing picket duty, and, per and perhaps obstructing our ability to get to the fight. Uh, in a timely manner. If we can't get there in time, we're probably not going to accomplish uh, what we need to, and therefore we have to take these things seriously. Kind of like this garish graphic right here uh, out of CFCA down in Washington a few years ago, just because it, show, it shows visually what happens as you approach the theater from Hawaii, from San Diego, Everett, Washington, whatever the case may be, you encounter more and more shore-based and sea-based uh, Chinese weaponry. You hit the yellow zone about the time you hit Guam, and it gets red as we approach our bases in Japan let alone uh, potential combat theaters like Taiwan or the Spratly Islands in the South China Sea or whatever. So this, I mean, this visually indicates the scale of the process of the problem. and also shows that it shows how seamlessly integrated land, land-based and sea-based uh, implements are for China as it tries to control and, and limit our access to the potential combat zones. And just a little eye candy, something that's made, something that's made a, lot of, uh, a lot of hubbub in the recent years since 2013 when China started uh, digging up and basically fortifying islands in the South China Sea and, uh, and making things, just basically adding another layer to this problem for the United States as we think about how to do things in that region. Or, or even this, I used to get laughs out of this when, uh, back in 2012 when I first started talking about uh, the, the China Coast Guard and the fishing fleet especially as the vanguard of Chinese sea power. But it's actually true. China has a China in the South China Sea in particular, but also in the but also in the, around the Senkaku Islands in the East China Sea, has used has used the China Coast Guard as the implement of choice to solidify its uh, territorial claims to those waters and island features. But it's not even that. It's, it's but if you look into the fishing fleet, and this was uh, used to get the laughs. It's, I mean, it sounds ridiculous to think that a fishing craft is an implement of sea power. But if you embed a maritime militia, as China has done for many decades now. 
if you put the if you put that in there, you, you all of a sudden you have an irregular force that's able to go up against uh, regional coast guards in the South China Sea, or even navies that are vastly outmatched by the PLA Navy. If you're if you're a coast guard, if your coast guard is more powerful than your adversaries, why not use that instead of sending a big hulking uh, destroyer and making yourself look like a bully? And that's why that and this is what China calls uh, or that what we call and what China is a practitioner of uh, gray zone operations. When you hear that term, it's uh, we're talking about using implements such as these to try to accomplish big uh, geopolitical things. Bottom line, as we asked this young lady again, that the strongest fleet, the strongest navy, need not win in action. You you have to keep the focus on the strongest force. And again, that's why we do things like wargaming at these uh, various scenarios, is to try to figure out who brings the most combat power to the decisive place and the decisive time, makes itself stronger and wins. And I think that, and I think that, I think we argue about this a lot because it's uh, the answers are really murky at uh, at present. Little 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 quip from uh, from uh, Albert Einstein a century ago, I, and I would leave you with this: Not everything we can count counts. Not everything that can be count, or not that not everything that counts can be counted. You're leaving a lot of the human dimension out. You're leaving all of these a lot of uh, a lot of subtleties out of this equation if you just focus on navies uh, and try to figure out who's that has the strongest fleet. Sum up all these bad ideas, and you get stuff like you get stuff like this out of, out of another wonderful scholar. This is John Mearsheim, Chicago, who basically concludes in his in his uh, well-regarded book. In fact, it's a, it's sort of he's field, but he basically concludes that the United States Navy and the U.S. military are ten feet tall. We are unbeatable. Let me break down this passage from the intro to that book. What he's saying, parse what he's saying. It's really kind of striking. He says that. He says, President, present day China does not possess significant military power. It's a pretty strong state that's, uh, that's made itself, it's made its Navy into a blue water Navy in a very short time, has done all these other things that I've, sh I've shown you on the screen. And here's how, he, here's how he justifies that conclusion. Its military forces are inferior to those of the United States. Think those two things necessarily go together? I mean, China. China. If you look, if you scope back over the history of communist China for the last uh, century, China has China's Red Army and now the PLA, PLA, PLA Navy, and, and the other arms have made a habit of winning. They have made a habit of be, being the weaker party and actually winning. They defeated the uh, they defeated the Chinese nationalists in the Civil War in the 40s, and they gave and they, and they gave and they gave as good as they got with the Japanese before that, and then of course there was Civil War even before the Second World War. So the weak can win. Do not, do not be taken in by the idea that uh, the United States, just because of all these quantitative measures, is automatically going to win. So anyways, once, you, uh, once, you do, once you accept those premises, though, it makes perfectly sen perfect sense to say that China will not pick a fight with us because they are inferior and so, and so forth. So again, I think this is a, a deeply uh, flawed way of looking at the, at the military balance in the Pacific. Which brings us to the last point that I want, I want to touch, touch on with you, which is the geography, the geopolitics. The United States only plays away games. Think back to those strategic documents we let off. We'll be number one in the Indian Ocean, in the Western Pacific, Persian Gulf, Mediterranean. We have to go a long way to get there. So geography works against us and the adversary works against us as well if we get into a fight with that adversary. It's really hard to be the away team uh, team's home port or home field and prevail, just as in sports. Now, here's a uh, no no Naval War College uh, lecture is complete without a word. Grand 18th century Prussia, and he, he tells a, he tells us a very simple thing in many words, as he has a habit of doing. But here, let me break it down for you a little bit, and this is, so you get a sense of what you're what, what our students are going through. Aussie now. And he said, if Clausewitz says the best strategy is to be very strong, which kind of makes sense. I mean, it's sort of, uh, you know, buy low, sell high type stuff. Go to Gold's Gym and work out all day and, uh, and make yourself strong. The, the nuances are a lot more complicated than that. First, you want to be stronger on the whole. Yes, I would like to have a bigger, uh, bigger armed force. But the main thing is to be stronger at the decisive point. Where is the battle going to happen? If I can make myself stronger at that place in that battle, and it doesn't really necessarily matter what my strength is relative to my adversary, that's really the to improve your possibilities of doing that. Clausewitz wants you to stay concentrated 
so that you can hope to make yourself strong and win. So he, he proclaims that the highest and the slot or the, the highest and simplest commandment of strategy, if you, if you will, is to stay concentrated thing for the United States to do and that's a, a relatively easy thing to do if you're the if you're potential opponents of the United States not only China but also Russia and especially Iran na nations that are trying to give us a hard time at he follows up he, he restates it a little bit more simply he says look you have to employ such forces as you have with such skill that even in the absolute absence of absolute super superiority again the overall force structure you do attain that relative superiority at the decisive place and time you do that, you have a good chance of winning. And that's a hard, again, that's a hard thing to do for ourselves. Why is that the case? Well, well Google uh, Earth, you can tell. I mean, look at the size of the Pacific Theater, the one where we want to make ourselves master of for the, for the foreseeable future. That can, you can see the United States over to the right. You can barely see the Aleutians to the top and, uh, and China and Japan off to the left. That's a really hard theater to traverse even in good times, let alone if somebody is trying to obstruct our access to that theater. But we know, we know that uh, zombies can swim, so let's figure out how we can slay them uh, as they obstruct our thinking about the Western Pacific. First and foremost, as I, as I just said, and any look, this is a big, big theater. Biggest, uh, biggest body of water on the face of the earth. Uh, and it's just, it's just a difficult place to do, to, do, to do things. I mean, for example, the Santiago, Santiago Chile is 10,000 miles from, from Manila, from, from Manila. And I think the same figure, similar figures would, would apply to, to potential combat theaters as well. That's a long way to steam. Here's a, here's a historical map that helps us uh, start breaking it down a little bit. This, uh, this dates from World War II, and it's uh, from, uh, by, by the way, it's from one of my favorite cartographers, a, a political map maker by the name of Richard Eads Harrison. If you happen to like these maps, which I will provide to you later, you can get out and Google his name, and you can find all these wonderful maps out of the Fortune Atlas of World Strategy from, 19, I think it was 1943, 1944, or thereabouts. What he is depicting in this, in this uh, particular map is what Japan was trying to accomplish in the Pacific during the, from, in the 1940s. I've outlined, I've outlined Japan's defense perimeter. This encloses what it wanted out of the war. It basically wanted control of the Western Pacific uh, as well as the South China Sea in particular, which is where a lot of natural resources that Japan needed to do what it thought it needed to do lie. It's a resource poor country and thus, and thus it, it, it wanted control of this uh, vast sea space. And this, uh, this is roughly, if you, if you read Chinese uh, statements of, of, of purpose and if you read their documents and uh, listen to what they say, this is, a, this is roughly speaking what China would like to accomplish uh, within the next uh, decade or two. It would like control of the waters, not only out to the first island chain, Japan, Taiwan, Philippines, but also even beyond the second island chain, which runs down through Guam. So again, it's, a, it's roughly comparable to what, to, to what Imperial Japan was trying to do back there in, in the 1940s. So that's a big thing. That's a, that's a big theater that they are trying to subdue if you take uh, Chinese uh, strategists at their world, or at their word rather. But there is a bigger theater. First, let me show you the, the theater that I just showed you on uh, Harrison's map. These are the, what the, this is that theater again. So again, the first island chain, out to the first island chain, the China Seas, and then out to the second island chain. This is what China cares about most. It would like to have control of these in order to accomplish a manifold bunch of things that, uh, that it has been talking about for many decades. But again, there's a bigger theater. What is the United States uh, theater that it cares about? That and everything else. Well, I mean, you can just look at this visually and you can tell what well, some of the dilemmas this presents to us. If we have interest in the Atlantic Ocean, the Indian Ocean, Persian Gulf, Mediterranean Sea, South Atlantic, whatever the case may be, this vast expanse is going to tend to stretch out U.S. forces as presidents and the secretaries of defense, uh, parcel out forces to try to uphold our commitments in each one of these places. It's going to tend to disperse our forces at a time in which China has the luxury of keeping its forces within that red zone that I've de depicted on the map. So we will be spread out. The, in Kosovitsian terms, that's gonna provide advantage for the PLA in fights that Beijing cares about right now and for the foreseeable future. Here's Moses, if you, if you think Moses, again, bringing down the highest and the simplest uh, commandment of strategy, stay concentrated. That's easier said than done for the United States military. I just said, 
what happens uh, what happens if uh, if President Trump or whoever occupies the over, Oval Office starting next year says, uh, okay, we're going to concentrate the vast majority, m much more than 60-40, we're going to put all of our military power in the Pacific in order to dominate that red zone. That's our priority theater. That's what we care about. What happens then? We're well, going to end up paying heavy, heavy opportunity costs. What are those forces doing all that kind of, I mean, that's obviously a silly example. That would never happen. But I mean, hypothetically, it could. But at that point, you would be sacrificing uh, your commitments elsewhere on the globe whether it's defense of the Atlantic, whether it's, uh, whether it's uh, holding, up, holding up our alliance with, with NATO or whatever the case may be. So again, Beijing can, can pose us a dilemma. If you care about coming into my back, backyard and defeating me, oh well, you're gonna, you're gonna lose out on a whole lot of other commitments that you really care about. And that's something that we really have to contend from from a strategic and a political standpoint. Which of those commitments could we do, do with that if we can't do without them, then I think we're we're in, we're in real trouble in the Western Pacific. There's I mean there's just physical distance. Uh, think about think about there's just that sheer distance of the across the Pacific Ocean from that uh, Google the, from that Google uh, Maps uh, or Google Earth uh, map I showed you a minute ago. It's just hard to get there. Here's another map from Harrison from the Second World War showing the world divided between the Axis and the Allies those convoluted rats that our forces have to traverse to get to places that we care about leaving from the east coast to the west coast sweeping around the left side or the right side of eurasia and africa in order to get into the theaters it's just not an easy thing to do especially when you consider that a lot of these sea and air rats would be contested by any savvy opponent which uh, which beijing most assuredly is so it's a, so again it's not just distance it's not just it's not all those things but it's also the fact that the adversary gets a say in whether we reach the reach the theater we have to have bases in order to support our presence in these remote regions this is a picture of a uh, picture of pearl harbor the first time i went there in the in the mid 80s late the late cold war very big very expensive and very extensive basing facilities again this uh, figures into that uh, that cost equation that we talked about uh, earlier on to wrap up the, the geophysical aspect of it, this is a metaphor that I really like. And this is something that if you think back to your basic physics, whenever you studied it, high school, college, whenever you studied the last, this is, this is a graphical depiction of the inverse squares law, which basically states in a nutshell that if I have a, a radiation source, a source of light or whatever, the, the intensity of that drops off, not in a slow and gradual way, or a slow and gradual and linear way, but it goes off a cliff. It, it, it drops off by the square of the distance from the emitting source. So if you look, if you look, if you look at this, if the, if the intensity is, is uh, this at this distance from the source, it's one quarter of that by the time you double the distance. And one ninth once you get out to triple the distance. To me, that makes a wonderful metaphor for how, it is, how hard it is to project military power from your shores. You have to have some sort of boosters in order to do it across many thousands of miles, such as in the Pacific, whether it's uh, bases like Pearl Harbor, whether it's uh, log a big logistics fleet, which is, which is actually kind of lean these days, all of these things figure into our ability to project power into, into distant combat theaters, especially in our adversary's backyard. So again, it's one, thing to, it's one thing to be Clausewitz or to be Moses or to be whoever and say, time, fine, that's a simple thing to do, but it's really hard to do in practice. And this leaves, this leaves aside another important, uh, another important part, the fact that the enemy in, in battle is not a potted plant. My adversary is not, going to, is not going to sit and let me do what I want to. He probably has a pretty good idea what I'm going to try to do. I'm going to try to surge forces across the Pacific from places on the West Coast and Hawaii to relieve the Seventh Fleet in Japan to do what we need to do, to concentrate forces in the theater and do what we need to do. But our adversary has every incentive not to let that happen. He has as many uh, brain cells as we do, as much desire to win, possibly even more so since the uh, fight will be in his own backyard. He's, he's going to exert himself to the utmost to try to keep us from actually accomplishing our strategy. Here's a, here's a face I like to put on this idea of the red team it's, and thinking about the adversary not being a potted plant, not being an inert mass who does what I want him to do. This is uh, General uh, Paul Van Riper. Back in 2002, uh, Van Riper uh, he was hired to he was hired to play Iran in a in a, uh, a war game called Millennium Challenge, and he was given the, uh, Iran's military resources, which are pretty bare bones, and he was given the task of fighting a U.S. Navy task force sitting offshore in the Persian Gulf. Oh, obviously we were talking about Country A and Country B, all that kind of foolishness we do in war games, but it was Iran, 
and uh, he, he was wildly creative. He took that, uh, that slender uh, endowment of resources and he put it to great use. And in fact, he, he, in fact, he defeated the U.S. Uh, task force. I mean, just a one silly example. Well, it actually wasn't silly. It was a wildly creative. Uh, the United States Task Force shut down Iranian communications, cell phones and whatnot. So he's doing crazy stuff like uh, using mosques to transmit operational orders to, out to the fleet to go get them. I mean, you, I mean he, just, he just showed himself to be a master of uh, using what resources he had to, to good effect. This was a prototypical case in which a, uh, a hypothetical weaker power defeated a stronger power. And something that backs up what I've been seeing about China, which is far more powerful than Iran, especially today. So if you think about it in sports terms, which I love sports metaphors, never, never listen to people who make fun of them. The United States, in a very real sense, is in the place, is in the place of the great Bruce Lee in fists of fury when he goes into the opponent's dojo and has to take down all of the dojos or all, the, all of ja his Japanese opponents using his, uh, using his fists of fury. Yes, he got it done, but at the same time, the odds were really stacked against him. Are we in a place in which we can hope to go into our adversary's dojo and actually, and actually accomplish what he did in that movie back in the 1970s? And I think that's really, that's really what we have to bear in mind. I mean, think about, that. Think about the, the advantages that go to the home team, any home team. This is, uh, think about going into college days in Texas and the SEC football and playing Texas A&M, where they claim to be the, the, the home of the 12th man. They have all that, they, they, they know the area, they have, they have the advantages of morale, Manpower is nearby. Their bases are nearby. nearby. They just, there are simply a, a, a plentiful number of advantages that go to the home team, especially when facing off against a visitor that's come a long way, like the United States will be. So, uh, so right, so right there, there's advantages. The crowd gets to the crowd. The, the home team, the, the, the people in the in the host country. I mean, they provide that morale advantage. They might be able to, in the case of the Chinese fishing fleet, they might be able to go out and harass the visiting team much as uh, visitors to, uh, to Duke University's Cameron Stadium find out uh, every year when they go to play Duke in basketball, and more often than not come away defeated, partly because of that crowd. And there's a last silly sporting analogy, but, but I think it's actually conveys something. It's, it's, it's almost like a WWE race, where you, you, know, you, have a, you, have a very, you have a very weak referee. There's nobody, there's nobody to regulate whether we have equal teams in the fight. If, they, if, they, if, the, if the PLA has more, have more stuff and more, fight, and more fighters, more wrestlers to throw into the rink, it can, come into, it can come into the rink and hit us over the head with a chair, much as you see at WrestleMania. So, again, there's no end to enforce rules, keep the teams equal. And, in fact, each, each side has the, has the incentive to, to throw dominant combat power into the fight. We don't want to win fair fights, nor do our Chinese adversaries. So I think this, uh, I think this is a silly example that conveys something real. Again. Never forget that the adversary gets a vote, as this Iraqi lady in 2005 voting for a president in Iraq uh, tells us. Guess how the enemy will cast that vote? If he's not a potted plant, he's going to cast it against us. And we, we have to really figure this out. Or we have to take that into account. So having gone through all that, having talked strategy, having talked fallacies, having talked to geography and, and the strategy as it fits into geography, here's where I would like to start leaving off. With, uh, with Mahan, who I, whom I mentioned at the outset, who gives us a really, really uh, broad, but also extremely powerful formula to think about this relative balance of power that I think is much better than the talking points you hear in, here in Washington, D.C., in the press, or whatever you read to, to keep up on the, on the events of the day. Here's what he basically says, and he's giving us a broad formula, a way to think about that, and it looks really simple, but it's actually really, really rich. He says, uh, if I want to figure out that if my fleet, and he's talking about the Navy, but a, a joint force in this case, I need to figure out whether my fleet is great enough to take on, take on the largest force it's likely to meet in battle. So this is sort of, the, this, these are sort of the statistical measures. Do I have enough units? Do I have enough capability? Do I have enough uh, supporting uh, sensors to tell me where the adversary is? All, all these sort of basic assessment tools. So, that's, a, that's, sort of the, that's sort of the stuff that you would need off with those basic uh, quantitative measures. But then, that's where it gets interesting. And then he starts talking about risk. Can I fight with reasonable chances of success? Is my fleet strong enough and big enough to fight so that I have a reasonable chance of success? How much risk am I willing to run? And that's kind of, that's kind of cool as well. I mean, you get into the psychology, you start thinking about uh, the president sitting back in Washington, wondering about uh, whether he should spend our forces lavishly for the, for the value of the gold that we have at stake. All of these sort of political calculations uh, figure in. 
And lastly, this is, to me, this is the most powerful, uh, the, the most powerful uh, word in the entire formula from Mahan, likely. Think about it if I'm China, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm in the PLA, if I'm, if I'm the Chinese Communist Party, looking at across the Pacific, how much of the United States armed forces am I going to face in a likely fight, whether it's in the East China Sea, the South China Sea, whatever the fight may be? Well, think about to those opportunity costs we talked about. How much, how much does the United States, the U.S. leadership, care about its goals in the Western Pacific relative to the Mediterranean Sea, given that we're historically an Atlantic-facing power, uh, relative to the Persian Gulf, given that we've been there forever? How much, how much force is President Trump or whoever inhabits the Oval Office prepared to break off from those other commitments to concentrate in the Western Pacific? That fraction of U.S. forces becomes the fraction whereby the PLA commanders measure themselves, and they measure the forces assigned to them. So again, there's a, there's a lot of political calculation that also goes into this, uh, this question of who has the strongest force and who is going to prevail. If I were to sum it up, and I just jotted this down, so let me know how I did. I think this is actually a better way of doing it than uh, going with simple metrics. First of all, do, do the Mahanian thing. Look, actually take those metrics, do an amalgam of them, and try to figure out who is physically stronger. Look at, look, at the, look at the political cost. Look at the actual costs of, of actually fighting in the Western Pacific, given all that weaponry China can apply to the costs we will incur by, by actually committing to such a fight. If you, think, if you think about it, if the United States uh, sees itself as the world's dominant sea power, and if our superpower status, status hinges on sea power, and if we, were likely, we calculate that we're likely to lose a large fraction of that in an afternoon in a fight off the, off of, off the Chinese coast, or somewhere in the Western Pacific, wow, that's a, that's a major opportunity to cost, to cost to pay for the independence of Taiwan, for the Senkaku Islands, and these other things. And these are some of the politics that you really cannot, uh, cannot neglect. And lastly, closely related, just think about how much risk each contender is willing to run. China cares much, is, is probably going to care more about what happens in its, in its backyard than we are likely to care since we will be in its backyard. And therefore, China is likely to be uh, more accepting of risk, whereas we're likely to be more risk averse. And this has to be a factor that you build into these uh, questions of strength as well. So this Mahanian template to me is a much uh, better way of thinking about relative strength and about our future in the Pacific uh, uh, moving ahead. Lastly, this is, the, this is how I would sum it up for you. This is the question we are really wrestling with and we, that we're going to be wrestling with for the foreseeable future. A fraction of our forces will be going up potentially against the entirety of Chinese forces in China's backyard. So it's not just Navy on Navy, it's Navy, it's Navy on the PLA Navy, supported by the PLA Air Force and all those, and all those aircraft I showed you, and, and the enemy's army, the potential enemy's army, as, a, as implicit in the uh, strategic rocket force that fields all those ballistic missiles for reaching out hundreds and hundreds of potentially thousands of miles to hit us. So you can, you can, you can conclude that uh, the United States, ship for ship, plane for plane, person for person, remains superior. And I do believe that we are. But at the same time, when you take a fraction of your force and put it up, the, up against the whole of an enemy court, far from your own home court, that's a, that, becomes kind of, that becomes kind of a sketchy calculation and, uh, and not an easy one to, to hold forth uh, with great confidence. So with that, I will leave you. I would, so when you see people like uh, Professor Mearsheimer again down, uh, down there in the middle in his classroom in Chicago or Bob Kaplan, any of these, uh, any of these other dignitaries, again, very, very smart people. But when you, when you hear them come out with really strong statements about the U.S.-China balance, I think I, would, I think I would start asking, asking the hard questions and, and pushing them to actually, uh, to actually put substance behind those because they are deeply misleading at times. And with that, we will turn to these lovely ladies and I will uh, field your excellent questions that I'm sure are forthcoming. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, just a superb uh, presentation. Uh, we've got a lot of questions here. I don't think we'll have time to get through all of them, but let's throw a couple out here. Uh, to start with, uh, how do the, our allies, joint forces, and our partners fit into the U.S. equation? We've talked mostly about the U.S. ability to respond to Chinese aggression. How do our allies and other folks join in the contributions? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's, it's a wonderful question. And I, and I deliberately uh, set this up as a solo U.S. on China fight just to keep, the, just to keep things simple. As you, saw, as you saw, it took a 
took a lot of talking just to get through the, the this, this rather simple dyad between the two of us. But the, uh, I mean, it's, I mean, if you think about it, there's there's a lot of ways. In fact, it's it's fact it's almost impossible to do what we want to do in the Western Pacific, let alone in Europe. I mean, really anywhere in the Eurasian rim lands, Western Europe or East Asia, we we just can't get it done without allies. First of all, I mean, we, I mean, think about it. Uh, I said bases are necessary to boost the signal to boost our military power in these in these very distant theaters. Think about it, if we got into a fight and, when, and Japan decided not to be part of it, as indeed it's not competent to be if we have a, if a fight in the Taiwan Strait. If Prime Minister Abe's government uh, stands aside, well, I mean, if we can't, uh, if, he, if, the, if the Japanese don't want to be sucked into the fight, they might not use, let us use our bases at uh, Yokosuka and Sasebo. At that point, at that point, it becomes really, really hard to sustain our combat power in the vicinity of Taiwan. So, right there, I mean, there's just the, the question of soil and bases. But when you start looking at forces as well, I mean, it's, I mean, if you, one thing I think that, and I don't do classified work, so I'm not exactly sure what the private conversations on this, but we seem to be working towards an even more tightly integrated U.S. and Japanese maritime force. Uh, for operating along the first island chain, principally, the, the Chinese have met the Chinese occasionally, well, they always threaten the Senkaku Islands and they occasionally threaten the Ryukus. Uh, they like to go through the Miyako Strait south of Okinawa. So there's, there's a lot of threats along that first island chain. And we've been working pretty closely with the Japanese to try to figure out how to prevent them from taking those islands. And also to, and also to, to help us, should we see the need to, to, to close those straits and basically shut the PLA Navy into the China Seas, shut the Chinese commercial fleet in and apply uh, commercial pressure that way on their economy. So yeah, you can, as, you can tell, as you can tell, you really just can't, you can't distinguish uh, that sharply between uh, that sharply between U.S. and Japanese forces. So that's Northeast Asia. And uh, rather than get too long-winded, I'll just uh, just to put, put a uh, put a point in on the larger aspects of this. Uh, China, I, I painted a pretty dark picture. I always do that, but uh, I think China has actually seriously overplayed its hands by being so bullying and by being so uh, aggressive. Not just this year. We can we can leave aside the coronavirus, but really when you look what it's over the last. Uh, I would probably trace it back to Scarborough Shoal when it went into the Philippines exclusive economic zone and basically drove the Philippines out of waters where it has exclusive rights to harvest resources. It's been very, very boastful, aggressive and so forth since then. But the good news is that that actually starts driving, driving together allies that are worried that are worried about Chinese aggression. I don't think we'll see a, an actual formal military alliance unless China does really something really, uh, really over the top aggressive. But at the same time, you're, you've now seen uh, Australia, Japan, and the United States, the Quad, which we, we call it, start having the, the discussions about a defense. India is very standoffish about the operations with the United States, and yet India is now India is now starting to work more and more closely with our military. So. So there's, I think I've, I put out a geographic point about bases, force integration with Japan. Uh, which you, you could say a lot about the United States and Australia, and then and simply the larger coalition aspects of this. The more China, the more China pushes, the more uh, coalition partners are likely to unite and push back. And that's and that's really this list of allies and our list of allies, friends, and potential allies. You're not going to take China's list of allies any old time. Who is it? North Korea? Yeah, come on. So. Jim, a number of our questioners have said. Uh, yeah, fairly dark uh, presentation. Uh, the question is, what do we do to make ourselves best able to deal with this situation? Are there issues related to emerging technology or gray zone operations that might allow us to improve our situation? Yeah, well, the, the first thing is to do something that I, uh, and you're actually seeing this happen, which is it's a beautiful thing to watch, but the and I, I alluded, I alluded to how the we're, we're seeing an age of joint sea power come on, and joint and jointness, of course, being an alliance among the armed services. I think we're actually seeing the U.S. armed services forge themselves into a unified tool to push back against this stuff. If you want to read something wonderful from last summer, if you if you like marine stuff, you can read the, the commandant's uh, planning the commandant's planning guidance from uh, I think it was last June or July. I think it was last July. But the Marines, the Marines have actually under Commandant Berger have said, look. We've been fighting in Afghanistan and Iraq and places like that for a long time. We're, to, we're not going to be a second land army anymore. We are now going to integrate ourselves into the fleet. So you're actually seeing the Marines do things to operate within, within that zone of, uh, which I showed you over which aircraft and, and missiles down into small units that can operate along those islands uh, and help the fleet get control of the sea, which is really what it's all about. 
So you, you, uh, the, US, or the U.S. Army has been all in on that. Uh, the, the U.S. Air Force is now doing stuff like uh, using A-10, A-10 aircraft that are uh, designed to go against enemy armies on the ground with close air support. They're, nice, they're now starting to do things like practicing using those against ships. It's just, there's just a lot of stuff, stuff coming together. So, and it's a, so again, it's been a really good thing to watch and uh, uh, it's good to see our sister services take ownership with that. And you could extend that logic out and look at allied forces as well. Royal Australian Navy uh, doing things with us in the South China Sea, which they've done in the recent weeks to demonstrate against Chinese tactics there and on and on. So basically we just need to get together and, and try to make ourselves a cohesive force able to operate at, at a long distance uh, from our shores. Uh, one final question, Jim. Uh, to what degree do you believe the Chinese underreport how much they are spending on defense? And are we able to see behind that curtain enough to know how big a challenge it actually is? Yeah, I, I, I would hesitate to put a number on it. Yeah, I think figures that come out of Beijing, and not, it's not just coronavirus figures, but uh, figures that come out of Beijing are worth what you pay for them. Uh, whether it's GDP figures, uh, I mean, think about GDP figures to, just to take it out of the military realm a little bit. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party over the last over the last 30 years, since or really over the almost 40 years now, yeah, actually over 40 so ever since China started its what they call the Reform and Opening Project to the world, this economic opening project. The Chinese Communist Party has has, has tethered its political legitimacy to to providing a constantly upgraded standard of living for the Chinese people every year. So if you think about that, that gives them an incentive to uh, to uh, uh, to drive up GD figures by a certain percentage every year, and who I mean, who's who actually oversees those figures? It's, it's, there's really no oversight at all. I think that plays. I think that that also plays into the military budget as well. Uh, so yeah, I, that would that would be very skeptical. You'd have to you'd probably have to ask people in Washington who do a classified work and watch this kind of stuff to get a clearer signal. But uh, but yeah, it's I would I would hesitate to guess. But uh, but yeah, yeah. Again, I, I would not uh, I would not take those at face value at all. Especially, especially given the advantages that they have, they might be able to do more with less as long as the fight is close in, which is what they care about. Uh, last comment, Jim, your uh, latest update on uh, your most recent book uh, on maritime strategy. Any, any plug you'd like to put in before we sign off? Oh, yeah, yeah I, want, I want whoever runs the Navy's, uh, the Navy's reading list, I hope they'll put that on there pretty soon. <laughs> John runs I, it. I, I, I think I just know. Plug. No, it's a, no, it's actually it's actually one that I would uh, that I would uh, actually commend to the audience, especially especially the spouses out there. It's 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 a really short book. Like it, it's called a brief guide to maritime strategy, and it's, I wrote it as a I wrote it as a lesson to myself 25 years ago. What would I have liked before I actually started learning about maritime strategy? Uh, to its credit, the Navy and the Sea Services have, have recognized that it's it's a good thing to start having strategic literacy, pretty much out of the year, uh, out of your commissioning source, whether it's ROTC, the Naval Academy, or whatever. So, it's a short, accessible book that's designed to help those youngsters come up to speed fast. And I think it would also be helpful for for people who aren't Sea Service practitioners as well, if you want to get a quick a quick and dirty on how this stuff works. So I reach back to Mahan, to the other greats like Corbett, and I, I put my own uh, special sauce on it as well. All right, Jim, well, thank you very much. Uh, it was an outstanding uh, presentation. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone who dialed in for uh, participating this afternoon. Yeah, we'll pause it. for about 30 seconds here, and then we'll switch gears for our family discussion group. So once again, thank you all for participating. Uh, next week, we'll be back, same time, same location, to talk about humanitarian uh, assistance. Thank you very much.